So welcome everyone to the O'Brien Institute for Public Health Anatomy of a Pandemic series. Tonight, we are pleased to host a conversation about striking a balance between infection control and isolation for residents of long-term care during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the three Seven region in southern Alberta. The city of Calgary is also home to Minty Nation of Alberta Region 3. While this acknowledgement refers to the lands where the University of Calgary is located, I also recognize that some of you may be joining us from other lands that were originally home to many other First Nations, Metis, or Inuit peoples across Canada and beyond. few words about the series. Uh, the Anatomy of a Pandemic is a digital forum that showcases work done by O'Brien Institute members and our wider university community. Um, and we're doing this to support authorities and governments in the response to the unprecedented scale of and the human cost exacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. Recordings of this and prior webinars can be found on the O'Brien Institute website. And I, you can see it here on the slide. In um, 1936, um, F. Scott Fitzgerald's essay, The Crack Up was published. And there's a quote from it that I want to start with. The test of a first rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. I think a test of first rate deliberations and discussions about COVID-19 should have the same attribute. We have to be able to hold two concepts in our mind at the same time, at the same time and strive to achieve balance. That could be between individual rights and communal good, uh, between infection control and keeping the economy open. And this is another, um, uh, example where we have two competing, at least on the surface, um, ideas that we have to keep in mind at the same time. I want to say a few words about the Brenda Stratford Center on Aging. Um, my name is David Hogan. I'm a specialist in geriatric medicine and I'm the academic lead of the Brenda Stratford Center on Aging in the University of Calgary. We are a center within the O'Brien Institute for Public Health, and we are very pleased to partner with the Institute in organizing tonight's session. Uh, the initiatives of the center uh, really aim to enhance the health of older adults and their well being, and also better inform public policy with regards to the aging population. Addressing COVID 19 will require coordinated involvement at multiple levels between operators, clinicians, residents themselves, most importantly, staff and the families of residents. Tonight, we are bringing together multiple perspectives and combining research, practice, policy, lived experience, as we integrate, uh, try to integrate and also question the challenges of balancing infection control and quality of life in long-term care. Uh, I'm moderating, so I'll try to keep my uh, comments to a minimum. Uh, we have two keynote addresses uh, and I'll be introducing our speakers in a few minutes. And then we'll have a panel discussion made uh, or contributed to by individuals speaking from different perspectives and I'll introduce them as well at the appropriate time. Now, I would like to um, uh, over um, a few of um, housekeeping items that you should be aware of. This tells you how to ask questions. For Zoom participants, we'd like you to use the Q&A box. For Facebook Live participants, use the comment box. And for Twitter, we use uh, your comments through that hashtag. Now, I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Craig Jenny. Dr. Jenny is an associate professor and a Canada research chair in the Department of Microbiology, Immunology, and Infectious Disease, and the Department of Critical Care 
medicine at the University of Calgary. Craig's research focuses on the immune response to bacterial and viral infections, and he hopes to understand how immunity can be modulated to improve clearance of infections, while also limiting collateral damage to healthy tissues. Many of you will also recognize Craig from um, local news media, where he has regularly provided his expertise on COVID-19 since the start of the pandemic in our community. Uh, welcome, Craig, and I will um, stop sharing my slides. And Craig, please go ahead and start sharing your screen now. So I'm hoping that's coming through. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hogan, for the, the invitation and for the introduction. I was uh, admittedly a little uh, concerned when invited to, to participate today as um, I really do not study uh, virus in long-term care facilities. And, and um, just as I cycle the slides to disclosures, um, my patients are actually small, brown, furry, um, have tails and, and are pretty bitey. Um, I, I'm a basic scientist, so I am not a clinician. Uh, but I do study how the virus moves and how we limit viral transmission. And I offered to provide a perspective on how can we better work to keep the virus out of patient populations that are at risk, such as long-term care facilities. And really, you know, what we're talking about is this guy right here. So this is a 3D rendering of the novel coronavirus. Lots of things on the surface, these big red mushroom looking things. This is our spike protein that you've likely heard about in the news. This is what we're targeting for vaccines and such. But really it's this little bag of lipid with some, some genetic material inside that's causing all the problems. If we look at our numbers in Canada, um, you know, we, we started quite well. In, in fact, we were able to uh, rapidly flatten this initial outbreak, so flattening the curve and getting our cases back down. But unfortunately, as fall set in and, and we resumed a lot of indoor activities, including school, as we opened more facilities, services, uh, you know, actions in the community, we have seen predictably cases rise. And unfortunately, we are now looking at numbers that are about 300,000 uh, COVID cases in Canada, and probably more concerning and tragic is that we have now lost over 10,000 Canadians to this disease. I routinely hear that this is simply another flu or a bad flu or some other, you know, variant of that argument. So I thought I would, you know, start with a, just a couple quick numbers. If we look at flu in Canada, we find that on average, any given flu season, we expect 10 to 20% of the population to be infected. This translates to three and a half to seven and a half million Canadians a year will contract influenza. That results in about 12,000 hospitalizations and about three and a half thousand deaths per year. If we look at that, that works out to be a very small fatality rate. If we look uh, of the number of cases, we're talking about 0.09% of all flu infected patients will uh, have a, a, a mortality associated with the infection. If we look at the general population, that's about nine Canadians per 100,000 people. So a very low mortality rate. If we compare this to where we're at with COVID so far, we have only infected approximately 0.8% of the population. Yet in doing that, our fatality rate is 38 times higher than what we see with the flu. And in fact, if we look at the, the population as a whole, our fatality rate is three times higher than what we see with the flu. So this is not simply another influenza. If we look at the numbers and break them down by age, and, and this is really the argument for, for how we're going to have to look at long-term care facilities, we can see that in fact the majority of cases are actually in younger people. 
So people under the age of 50 represent about half the cases and only 15% of all COVID cases occur in patients uh, 70 or up. Unfortunately, that does not reflect the same distribution as we go through severity of disease. So looking at, again, the nation as a whole, we've seen almost 20,000 people hospitalized. So about 8% of all cases result in hospitalization. Of those, one in five patients end up in the intensive care unit. And about 5% of all cases require hospital ventilation. Now, the problem is, is that the burden of disease is not borne evenly. So whereas younger people make up the bulk of cases, the severity of, of cases uh, tends to result in older patients. So hospitalizations, for example, we see that 15% of overall COVID cases in patients 70 and up, but half of the hospitalizations are these patients. If we look at intensive care unit, again, we're seeing 40% of, of all the ICU admissions are this smaller group of patients. And most disturbingly, we see that basically 90% of all mortality associated with COVID is in patients 70 and up. So this is really painting the picture that this is a virus, it can kill, but it is disproportionately affecting older Canadians. So why is that? Why is it this cohort of patients represents the minority of cases, but the majority of disease burden? And there's lots of reasons, you know, immunity uh, can decline with age. Um, many of these patients have comorbidities, which put them at risk. And critically, we've seen unfortunately outbreaks in long term care facilities where we have a large concentration of patients that fit these risk factors of age and comorbidities. So maybe it's not entirely surprising that when we get an outbreak, unfortunately, mortality goes up and these tend to result in, in clusters of death. Why are the patients in these facilities more overrepresented than, for example, uh, simply older Canadians in the population as a whole? And part of that is, again, People that are healthy sometimes are not in the long-term care facilities and instead can continue to live in private residence. Uh, we've seen across the country uh, issues with staffing where individuals have to look after multiple patients, increases the risk of spread. There's been issues of screening patients, visitors and staff, and the, the very difficult part of isolating a case within these facilities. And I'm not gonna dwell on, on how we can maybe work or discuss the, the internal operation of a long-term care facility. Instead, I'm gonna focus on this statement here. Once the virus gets in, things get bad very quickly. So how do we keep the virus out? Well, there's a strong argument and common argument that we simply have to lock these facilities down, seal off the patients. If virus can't get in, then we don't have to worry about it. Virus can continue in the community with relatively low risk to the population as a whole. Although, you know, it, it seems like an appealing argument on paper, there's a lot of problems with this approach. And that is, you're really unfairly shifting the responsibility of the disease to a, a, the population that's perhaps not at, at all responsible for driving COVID numbers. We know that there's a significant mental health problem with locking uh, long-term care facilities down. And this again is targeting a population that is very much at risk. Once again, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on these, but I tend to focus a little bit more on, it's essentially impossible to actually lock down a facility. As much as we like to use this term, impractical means, I, I, I don't know how it happens. And I was trying to come up with a way to explain this and uh, partly also starved for hockey. Um, and, and one thing that came to mind is the idea of, of having a good defense. And if I think about the best defense out there, you know, a few people come to mind, including this particular individual. So for those that aren't familiar, uh, Ken Dryden was an NHL goalie and arguably one of the best. You can spend hours online listening to people argue why he should be the best or shouldn't be the best. And at the end of the day, I'll let his numbers speak for themselves. So he played in about 400 games he has one of the highest save percentages of all goalies in the NHL of all time. So 
basically 0.922. This is a remarkably high number. And what shocked me is his winning percentage. 82% of all games he starts, he wins. So this is perhaps the single best defender in professional hockey. However, if we look at the numbers from a different way, it's saying that seven out of every 100 shots got by him. And although he's among the leaders in shutouts, so games where nobody scored on him, there's still 350 games that somebody put the puck behind him. And if we relate this to the ability to try and lock down a facility, the more chances, the more viruses that are attempting to get in, the more people that are infected, it becomes impossible to keep 100% of them out. We all like to think about our defense mechanisms like this, a very simple, straightforward, we have skilled people that know what they're looking for. And if this is the case, odds are it will work. The reality in Canada lately is that this is what we're dealing with. That the viral load in the community is so high that the chances of somebody walking in the front door of a facility, be it a visitor, be it a staff member, be it anybody, there's a risk that they're importing the virus with them. And the more people that do this, the more difficult it is to keep 100% of the cases out. If we look at Alberta as of yesterday, there are 10,000 active COVID cases. So basically one quarter of a percent of all Albertans have active COVID. It sounds like a really small number. That works out to be about one in 400 people across the province. This is averaging for all the rural areas, all the cities, all the hotspots. If we look in Calgary, we see that that actually shoots up a little bit. It's about one in 330 people. And in Edmonton, it's even worse. One in 250 people have ongoing active viral infection. Again, these numbers sound big, but if we think of a C train here in Calgary, so our light rail transit, each train holds 800 people. So there would be two to three infected people per train which means the odds of you coming in contact with an active viral case in the community is getting higher and higher as this pandemic progresses. So how do we keep it out? Well, again, the, the idea of a lockdown is, is appealing in a simplistic point of view, but it's not just the visitors, it's not just the family that are at risk of bringing the virus in. Staff, suppliers, everybody else that enters that building is a risk to import virus. I mean, we cannot expect everybody to quarantine and live permanently in these facilities. People who work there still have to take transit, get groceries, have children in schools. This increases their viral exposure. And when that goes up, they increase the risk of viral exposure at work. So how do we fix it? Well, you know, there's some arguments and testing can help but it's not gonna be a panacea. This is not a silver bullet. So we have to reapproach this. The other evidence we have that it's essentially impossible to lock a facility down is if we look at hospitals, especially here in Alberta. These are facilities where the staff are fully trained in infection control, have access to personal protective equipment and have protocols in place such that if a virus or other infection were to enter the hospital, we should be able to limit its spread. Yet, even with all of those controls in place, we have 13 acute care facilities that currently have outbreaks in the province. If we look outside the province, we have 52 active outbreaks in long-term and acute care facilities in British Columbia, 107 long-term care facilities with outbreaks in Ontario that are comprising of 700 residents infected and an additional 533 staff are infected. So even though we know the virus is critical to keep out of these facilities, we have access to PPE, we still can't do it. So this is the hard evidence that the idea of, a, of sealing off a facility and locking it down is simply a, a not a feasible approach, regardless of the ethics, regardless of the other health impacts. As far as a mechanistic point of view, it's almost impossible to achieve. So how can we enhance the protection? Well, we have to provide some support to our defenses. We cannot tie up our defenses. So one of the best ways to do this is simply reduce the number of times our defense is tested. What I mean by that is if there's less virus in the community, there's less risk of an individual entering the facility and bringing the virus with them. So we need to reduce community numbers. 
We also have to break the ability of the virus to transmit. So this involves cohorts, ensuring that both employees and visitors are not interacting with large numbers of people. If we can keep those contacts down, the risk of individual infections uh, drop quite quickly. Another potential problem here is this identity of community sources. And I just want to point that out before we move on to the final point of, of my, my talk. Is right now, we know that about 90% of all COVID cases in Canada are acquired within Canada. And the good news is we can track down a, a, a number of them, about two thirds nationwide, we know the source. But that means one third of cases in Canada, we don't know where the person actually got the virus. And this makes it impossible to model how the virus is gonna spread and which groups are at risk of introducing the virus into a facility. We need better contact tracing. We need to know who these people are. And one way to do that is to have wider, more rapid testing. And we've seen a lot of controversy around this. But it's important to remember that even if we could test everybody in a facility, that represents a single point in time. And as soon as somebody walks out the door and buys groceries, they would then require a new test. We also have to ensure that the test we're using has essentially no false negatives. In the general community, we can afford to miss a case or two. In these long-term care facilities, if we miss a case, again, the results could be disastrous. And with these large number of anonymous untraceable contacts, we really need some technology to help us. And we've seen a number of apps launched, both provincially and federally, but really the success of those has been quite disappointing. And, and we've seen news today that the, the provincial app has really only been useful in identifying 20 cases over the last six months. So definitely an area we need some work. So just to wrap it up, Although we could look at locking down a facility, really the solution is to provide other defenses and, and to build a multi-layer defense. And one of the best analogies I've seen is this idea of a Swiss cheese model, that if we rely on any one mechanism, there's gonna be holes. But if we can layer multiple defense mechanisms, low community numbers, accurate tracking and contact tracing, as well as fairly tight restrictions at a facility, and rapid testing, layering all the defenses together make it more impermeable. So we should not be relying on any one mechanism. Instead, we have to build a network of defense. Much, again, to bring it back to the original argument, much the same way a hockey team does. It's never just the goalie. The defense starts with a strong offense, a defense, and a goalkeeper. So with that, I'm going to just summarize by if we want to keep the virus out of the facilities, we have to really keep the numbers down. This provides a little bit of leeway and forgiveness in all of our other mechanisms. So I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak today and I will hand the uh, control back over to our moderator. Thank you very much, Craig, a uh, great talk. Every time I see a C train, I'll be thinking about two to three people with COVID on the train. Uh, I, I think just to give an example of how devastating these outbreaks can be, um, you probably have heard the recent outbreak in Edmonton in the South Terrace Continuing Care Center. It's a 107 long-term care bed facility. They had a staff member uh, diagnosed with COVID-19 on the 22nd of October. And by the 13th of November, three weeks later, they had 83 residents test positive, and they had 81 staff test positive, and there were 11 deaths among residents in that facility. And uh, data from Canada suggests that 81% of all deaths in Canada from COVID-19 are occurring in people in long-term care facilities, both nursing homes, long-term care facilities, but also within um, designated as supportive living and assisted living facilities. So it is a major issue and thank you very much, Craig. So I want to move on and introduce our next speaker, Lisa Poole. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Lisa Poole. She's a family care partner and provides insight from the perspective of a lived experience. Her father, John, unfortunately has a diagnosis of vascular dementia and is a resident in a long-term care facility. Lisa is an active member of the um, community 
um, and contributes her time to the Dementia Network, Calgary's Strategic Council, the Alzheimer's Society of Calgary's Board of Directors, Agewell's Older Adult and Caregiver Advisory Committee, the Alzheimer's Society of Canada's COVID-19 Task Force, and also has um, been a member of the Dementia Care and Support Advisory Team for the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvements Community-Based Dementia Care and Support Advisory Team. She is also co-chair of Dementia Advocacy Canada and is the founder and editor of Dementia Connections magazine. Whenever we have a, a request, Lisa is always more than willing to contribute and we've always benefited from her input. Lisa, you may share your screen now. Thank you, Dr. Hogan. Uh, let's just see here. And thank you very much for inviting me to speak about the importance of recognizing families as essential partners in care. There's a lot of talk about numbers and an increase in cases. As Dr. Jenny explained, the statistics show that people living in long-term care are bearing the brunt of COVID-19 and that no other first world country has a long-term care infection rate or death rate higher than Canada's. In fact, so far, long-term care residents, as Dr. Jenny said, and I think maybe his numbers are a little more updated than mine, but they're very close. I have 81% of all reported COVID-19 deaths um, are in Canada from long-term care compared with an average of 38% in other developed countries. And I think we can all agree that this, this is absolutely unacceptable. From an infection control perspective, it makes perfect sense to lock things down, physically distance, and reduce social interaction to stop the spread of the virus. We all want the pandemic to end. But for people like my father, John, who live in long-term care, the isolation and separation from family can be devastating, especially if they're in the final months of their lives. And it's devastating for their families too. The numbers matter, but so does quality of life. Long-term care residents like my father are more than a number and they deserve to be treated with humanity and compassion. Since the pandemic began, stories of neglect and abuse have flooded the news. There were even reports of residents exhibiting symptoms of confinement syndrome, a prison term used to describe the symptoms associated with solitary confinement, which is typically a punishment. These symptoms include dehydration, functional decline, and depression. These stories have resulted in tremendous anxiety for families who are not allowed to visit and fear the worst for their family member in long-term care. Ontario held a long-term care commission to investigate resident experiences during the first wave of the pandemic. Residents, unable to receive family or uh, leave their room for months, described their pandemic experiences with words like lonely, muzzled, and trapped. One of the most heartbreaking comments was, now when I see these dog cages on TV for stray animals, I see myself as one of these neglected, filthy, and starving for love and affection little critters. Isolating people for months in an effort to keep them safe has been a catastrophic failure. Who's accountable? For many residents, the health risks of COVID-19 have been eclipsed by the health risks of loneliness and isolation. In BC, the issue of visitor restrictions has generated more responses to the Office of the Senior Advocate than any other issue in its history. And many people describe the negative impact of limited or no visits, expressing more fear about loneliness than of contracting COVID-19. These health risks apply to both the long-term care resident and to their family care partners. A study published last month by Jasneet Parmar and Sharon Anderson at University of Alberta reported that 40% of care partners with a family member in long-term care 
saw a significant deterioration in their own mental and physical health in the first few months of the pandemic. The visitation restrictions triggered distress, feelings of anxiety, depression, and loneliness. Restricting family from long-term care has created a whole new group of isolated people, mostly older adults, who have also lost their social connections as regular visits to long-term care were an integral part of their daily routine. One of the recommendations in the U of A study is the need to recognize the essential role of family care partners who provide physical care as well as emotional and so social support in all health and social care settings. Dr. Anderson and Dr. Parmar have developed an excellent six module framework for caregiver centered care to help healthcare professionals understand the importance of recognizing family care partners as members of the care team. It's free and it's available to the public. And if you're interested in learning how we can better support family members who provide care, I strongly recommend this resource. Before COVID-19, families contributed an estimated 30% of the care in long-term care settings. Family care partners comprise a huge unpaid workforce and are referred to as the backbone of the Canadian healthcare system. And when I say families, I'm also referring to friends or anybody else whom a long-term care resident has selected as their designated care partner or support person. Everybody in this photograph is involved in providing some kind of support to my father. Typically, a family member visits him every day. We help my dad eat meals and try to get him outside as much as we can. My father is used to having people around him who are supporting him, loving him, and touching him. Families notice when there's been a change that requires attention, which could be subtle and might be unnoticed by someone unfamiliar with the resident's individual tendencies. What might be normal for one resident is cause for alarm in another. As an example, my mother identified that my father had had a minor stroke that hadn't been recognized by staff. Families must be recognized as an essential part of the care team. It's unrealistic to think, to think that staff have time to provide companionship, especially under pandemic conditions. This is an important role for families. Window visits, physically distanced outdoor visits wearing masks, and video calls are better than nothing band-aids that at least allow families to see each other but are not a viable long-term solution. For people with advanced dementia like my father, who mostly uses touch to communicate, these options are deeply unsatisfying and largely ineffective. COVID has been hard on everybody in long-term care, residents, their families, and staff. There has been widespread chronic understaffing in long-term care for many years. The virus has led to even further staff shortages and remaining staff are overwhelmed, scared, and exhausted. If anything, family involvement is needed now more than ever. Replacement staff hired to cover staff shortages are unfamiliar to residents and often lack understanding about dementia, which is a problem because approximately 80% of long-term care residents are living with some kind of dementia. Families can help mitigate this disruption by providing comfort and familiarity. And just to be clear, I'm not pointing any fingers at staff. In fact, I think the people doing the work in long-term care deserve our recognition and gratitude. They're doing the best they can in impossible circumstances, and I know that my family is deeply appreciative of the efforts that have been made at my father's care home to provide his care, keep us informed, and facilitate visits. An increased reliance on temporary staff means there are a lot of different people providing care, which is not ideal for people with dementia who need continuity and, and benefit from developing relationships with those who provide their care and understand their personal preferences. 
One worker, one site policies introduced during the pandemic are a critical element for infection control and are also an essential ingredient for consistent care assignments, proving to have many benefits as they allow for the development of personal relationships built on trust and emotional connection. There are challenges to ensure that one site policies are upheld during an outbreak, but going forward, one worker, one site policies and consistent care assignments should be made permanent to facilitate both relational care and infection control. A study conducted in Holland, published in July, shows no link between family presence and an increase in COVID-19 cases. And as far as I can find, there is no evidence to dispute these findings or to suggest that family access to long-term care should be restricted. Likewise, keeping families out of care facilities did not protect residents from getting the virus. But of course, if families want to be recognized as part of the care team, they have to do their part, ensure that they understand infection control and protective, personal protective equipment. If care staff can safely touch a residents under the right circumstances, which includes respecting infection control and the appropriate use of PPE, family can too. In a study conducted last summer by Dr. Gwen McGann from the University of Calgary, 84% of respondents stated that they are willing to go any necessary training in order to have continued access to the people living with dementia that they care for. So um, to this end, Dementia Network Calgary partnered with the Red Cross to create a one hour online course to teach family of long-term care residents about infection control and how to correctly put on and take off PPE. The Alzheimer's Society of Calgary created an online companion course to help people anticipate how their family member with dementia might react to seeing them with a mask and other issues related to COVID-19 as they pertain to people living with dementia and long-term care. And so far, approximately 250 family care partners, including me, uh, have completed this course. Since uh, in Alberta, our current public health orders allow for family visits and for physical touch. As of July 16th, two designated family care partners are allowed per resident. Safe touch is allowed even during an outbreak. You have to keep your mask on and to sanitize your hands before and after contact, but please visit the Alberta government website for complete details. Vulnerable Canadians living in long-term care have been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Families can and want to be part of the solution. We want to be recognized as essential partners in care, and we want to be able to see and touch our family members who live in long-term care settings. If our COVID-19 case numbers continue to rise, we must resist the urge to look only through the lens of infection control. We must also consider the devastating consequences of isolation. For many, the value of family visits outweighs concerns about COVID-19. One worker, one site policies, consistent care assignments, infection control education, and PPE training for family members are key elements that allow us to follow in infection control measures and have safe family visits families must not be denied access again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa, for your thoughts and your words. Um, I, I do want to mention that the Health Technology Assessment Unit uh, at the University uh, of Calgary, directed by uh, Dr. Fiona Clement, uh, Clement um, do do um, rapid reviews of the evidence on COVID-19. And they did look at prevention and transmission of COVID-19 in older individuals uh, residing in long-term care facilities. And highlighted a number of approaches that can be taken that might be effective in addition to uh, strict uh, restriction of, of visiting. So I, I do think we have to, as uh, Craig said, take a Swiss cheese approach 
and, and look at various ways of trying to protect residents of long-term care facilities. Just to um, also highlight a point Lisa made, um, in 2020, uh, American data shows that there's a devastating increase in mortality among people with dementia compared to 2019 and earlier years. And of the over 200,000 excess deaths, uh, about two thirds of them are directly related to COVID, but another third are related probably to disruption of care and um, the mental health consequences of being isolated in facilities and away from their families. So we do have to take a broad picture and a broad perspective. Now, um, we've learned about um, two different perspectives. I wouldn't say opposing priorities, but two different perspectives that have to be acknowledged and dealt with when it comes to ways that our governments and practitioners and facilities can respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is trying to balance protecting residents from the infection and also workforce uh, in long-term care facilities from the infection, but also not um, destroying people's quality of life and um, keeping families involved. We've gathered a panel of experts who will now be able to talk about the challenges of this balance um, from different perspectives. First, we'll hear from uh, Mr. Wayne uh, Morishita, who is the Executive Director of the Alberta Continuing Care Association and represents facility operators. Wayne facilitates collaboration with the provincial government, Alberta Health Services, other partners, and all stakeholders to identify solutions to address the increasingly complex challenges facing continuing care providers during these um, difficult times. I'll introduce all our panel uh, to start with. Our second panelist is Dr. Vivian Iwa, who is a clinical associate professor and section chief, seniors care in the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Calgary. She's also the medical director, facility living, Alberta Health Services for the Calgary Zone. Our third panelist is um, a colleague of mine, Dr. Jim Silvius. Uh, Dr. Silvius is a clinical associate uh, professor. I think he's really a full professor, clinical professor in the Department of Medicine, Division of Geriatric Medicine at the University of Calgary. He has numerous leadership positions um, that he's held over his career and most recently holds the combined role of provincial medical director, seniors health, and the senior medical uh, director, seniors health strategic clinical network. Now, please remember to enter your questions into the Q&A uh, box. And uh, if you're joining us from Zoom or else use um, uh, via Facebook uh, Live or Twitter, um, the um, uh, chat box and for Twitter, um, using the hashtag O'BrienCovid19. Uh, Wayne, you may now begin with your response. Now we follow by Dr. Iwa, Dr. Silvius, and then uh, we'll throw it open for questions from the audience uh, directed to our panelists and also to our presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hogan. And thank you for the opportunity tonight to speak on behalf of the Alberta Continuing Care Association Regarding the challenge, our operators have been in trying to balance resident safety with their physical and mental well-being. Uh, let me first tell you a little bit about the Alberta Care, uh, Alberta Continuing Care Association to put this into context of who we are. Uh, we're a nonprofit voluntary organization representing providers across all streams of continuing care in Alberta including home care, supportive living, and long-term care. Our members are faith-based, public, private, and nonprofit, And our diversity is our strength in recommending solutions that contribute to truly person-centered care. Um, our members care for more than 13,000 residents in the province in designated supportive living and long-term care homes and we also provide over 5 million hours of home care annually. Uh, ACCA has represented continuing care operators for almost 40 years, allowing for informed productive relationships between the government and operators. A significant proportion of ACCA members have been serving Albertans for more than three decades. 
with several dating back over 70 years in the sector. Now, when the pandemic hit Alberta and started to enter our care homes, our members became laser focused on trying to minimize the spread of this deadly virus while transforming in real time in never before experienced conditions that impacted every aspect of their organ organizations. The story of continuing care in Alberta over the past eight months is one of both heartbreak and of triumph. There are chapters that speak to the heroic efforts made by operators and staff and of the passion and commitment they bring every day. How residents are like family and how they have grieved, not only over the loss of life, but the loss of connection. How they felt the ache of loneliness, confusion and despair of their residents and done everything in their power to help alleviate that for them. It tells all the fear, uncertainty, and anxiety brought on by a pandemic that was unknown, rapidly spreading, and seemingly ever-changing. It also speaks to the utter fatigue that they feel because of that and the strain on our resources and staff. But it's also a hopeful story, filled with truth and authenticity to overcome the many misperceptions that exist and cast a shadow on the truly good that cast a shadow on the truly good work being done and quality of care being given it lists the curtain providing a different narrative that's featured in the media headlines recently acca connected with our operators representing home care supportive living and long-term care to have in-depth conversations about the impact of COVID on their operations and residents. The challenge, challenges of striking a balance between infection control and the well-being of residents in isolation were raised throughout the interviews. Resident safety and well-being are the top concerns of Alberta operators and it's their utmost priority. Those operators and their staff are committed to doing everything they can to care for residents who often become like family to them. Visitation is a critical issue for operators. And like most issues in life, there are mixed views. Relaxed, greater visitation is supported by some families and staff to support resident well being and acuity, while others prefer reduced visitation to reduce risks. The additional demands on staff to ensure visitation protocols are followed is tremendous. With the exponential increase that we've seen in community spread, there is concern about from operators about visitors potentially bringing in the virus into facilities. You know, as, as uh, Dr. Jennings was saying, once the virus gets in, things get bad. It's very difficult to keep it out, you know, to prevent the spread within a facility and to get rid of it. Staff are doing all they can to care for residents, but their jobs are more difficult than ever. You know, as Lisa said, our, our members tell us that staffing levels are stretched. Outbreaks can quickly happen and significantly reduce the availability of staff. And single site solutions have also had an impact on the availability of staff. Staff and management burnout are an issue as well. Staff members are feeling conflicted, wanting on the one hand and being asked to do more for the residents while working with much more time intensive processes to keep residents safe. You know, for example, suiting up with PPE or cleaning and disinfecting. You know, this is one resident at a time versus caring for a few at a time pre-pandemic. Concerns about the sector and infection resulted in some staff leaving. Some mentioned staff being terrified to work and for fear of contracting the virus and taking it home to their families. 
you know, it all sounds really simple. Reduce the outbreaks, which reduces restrictions for families and thus reduce isolation. But the more transmission you have out in the community, the more risk you have for outbreaks in the care facilities, no matter how hard we try to keep it out. Despite all the challenges brought on by COVID, feedback from family members and residents to our members is still largely supportive and positive. Almost everyone who participated in the interviews with our members shared that feedback from these families had been positive. Most of what we've heard over the recent months has been supportive and appreciative of staff's challenges and efforts. This is also consistent with the recent COVID survey conducted by the Health Quality Council of Alberta in August through into September with over 9,000 family members of residents in long-term care. Now, there were specific concerns, certainly, that were raised by families, and they included the inability to visit loved ones, no visitation with residents who were palliative. Residents really miss recreation activities and socialization. Operators and staff are doing the best they can. There are still men, many wonderful things that are taking place. Worry that a loved one was not able to get the care and attention that they need or that they may be lonely or missing their regular routines and activities intended to maintain or improve their health. Operators know that some residents' physical health has deteriorated along with mental health during the lockdowns. Weight loss, acuity, memory and retention. You know, we've, they've also, we've also seen that some relatives and friends don't visit because they don't want to be compromised or have their own health issues. You know, to try and address these concerns, continuing care operators are being creative to keep families connected with loved ones and to try to avoid isolation. For example, uh, one of our operators employed a, an aqua trailer at a site for visitation purposes. And that was very well received. And in fact, that operator will be expanding that program to additional sites and having heated ACO trailers for cold weather visitation. Social media has been very helpful and, and been used to engage family and loved ones. It's reduced stress on families because they could see and understand understand what was happening inside the facility and it was also a morale booster for staff and operators that it was a successful channel for communication. Other uh, creative things that were done were the adoption of technologies like FaceTime and Zoom. Uh, that, that's helped many families maintain social ties as best as they could. All, although this wasn't as effective for everyone, depending on their situation. And this was often confusing to older patients or patients with dementia. Although not a solution for physical visitation, families and operators often came up with unique solutions to reduce feelings of isolation. Uh, one of the operators and, and a and a family member organized a vintage car parade in front of the facility, uh, which was very well received and supported by the community. Letters and cards to seniors. Other community parades, exterior decorations that were occurring at the facilities and, and window visits. Now, Earlier on in my presentation, I, I spoke of the misconceptions about continuing care Alberta that need to be corrected. Continuing care plays a, a critical role for Alberta families, providing options that will help seniors to continue living a high quality of life at home and in care centers that will become home. 
It's about living, not dying. We need to be stronger across other industry, no matter what type of continuing care we deliver. For the past eight months of this crisis, we have opened up our hearts, braced our backs, and leaned in for the fight. As we face the second wave in our province, it's more important than ever that we link arms and support each other for the good of our industry and the vulnerable people in our care. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wayne. Vivian, you're next. Okay. So uh, thanks a lot for uh, the opportunity to uh, present on the um, on the uh, on uh, this uh, topic, uh, which certainly uh, it's uh, uh, very uh, important and uh, close to my um, close to my heart in terms of looking at that balancing act uh, between um, infection, uh, keeping the virus out, as well as um, as well as um, mitigating the risk of uh, isolation. So I hope you can all see my slide. Um, I have a picture up there that um, reminds me a lot about a home. So where I come from originally, uh, we have fishermen and um, it's always amazing to see how they can stand at the edge of the fishing boat and uh, still have another leg wrapped around the fishing pole with the fishing net out in the uh, ocean. And um, it takes a lot to be able to do this and maintain your balance. And so when I think about um, how we've been able to manage the uh, COVID-19 outbreak response in long-term care settings, um, it's really been a balancing act. It's really been one of how do we keep the virus out, like uh, Craig says, you know, how do we ensure that even when the virus does come in, how can we contain spread and at the same time mitigate the risk of uh, social isolation, uh, the impact of isolation, quarantining residents to the room, the impact of um, um, not having social act, uh, activities on site, the impact of staffing. And so that has been the story of uh, frontline staff, of operational leaders, and of uh, physicians who work in these care settings. And as Wayne has alluded to, a lot of the impact of uh, the measures that we put in place in long-term care has certainly been heartbreaking, not just for residents and families, but also for the staff and physicians who work in these uh, care settings as well. And so I'm just gonna step back a bit and just sort of talk about the profile of the long-term care resident. And in particular, I'm, I'm going to be describing the resident in the Calgary zone long-term care setting, which really uh, represents uh, the long-term care resident in, in other parts of um, Alberta and possibly most of uh, Canada. And I do have to say that when you look at the long-term care resident in Alberta, we, they do differ a lot from the rest of, rest of the country. And that's because we have varying levels of care, like um, Wayne described. Uh, we have uh, home living, we have uh, supportive living, and we do have a lot of uh, residents that are in our various supportive living streams. And so what we end up with in long-term care is actually the very frail um, and vulnerable uh, persons in our population. So if you look at the average age in long-term care, it's about 81, 82 years. Um, if you look at the rate of dementia, it's almost 60%. And when you look at the, uh, the persons who have dementia, um, with a CPS of four, and the CPS refers to the cognitive performance scale. And this is one of the indicators that we have on our resident assessment uh, tool. You will find that almost 60% of, of our residents have severe stage dementia. 
um, if you look at ADL impairment, which simply means the assistance that is required to support activities of daily living, almost 98% require um, assistance. And in some cases, almost um, total uh, care. And so you really are looking at a population of uh, residents that are very frail and certainly very vulnerable and certainly fit the profile that Craig was describing in terms of the, uh, the population that is more susceptible to higher mortality, higher morbidity from a COVID-19 infection. And again, this uh, meta-analysis that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Directors Association, which looked at almost you know, over 600,000 um, uh, residents across uh, many jurisdictions in uh, China, in Italy, in um, Spain, and in, in New York and in Washington. And what they found was that the case fatality rate was certainly highest. Um, in persons who were aged 80 and above. And Craig has already spoken to this, and this is the data from Alberta. Again, um, really, uh, really um, supporting the fact that when you look at where COVID-19 infection is having its most impact in terms of morbidity and mortality, it really is in the, um, in the population that is aged 80 and above. And so when you look at the, even the Alberta numbers, and I mean, looking at Calgary, where we have uh, 172 deaths, out of which 112 of those have actually occurred in long-term care facilities. And so we, we do know that in these settings, we have the frailest and the most vulnerable um, to COVID-19 infection. And so in terms of outbreak measures, I mean, initially um, at the start of the outbreak, there really was a lot of focus on acute care and really trying to protect the hospital capacity, ICU beds. But like we all know, uh, it quickly um, unfolded that, you know, uh, a lot of uh, the people who were getting uh, hit in terms of the, the infection and, and, and suffering from significant uh, um, morbidity and mortality, it was really those in our long-term care setting. And so we implemented a number of measures and a lot of these measures were not with, without their challenges. Uh, one of the things that we quickly had to do was that early recognition. So we realized that um, in the older population, uh, the typical presentation is actually atypical. And so your usual respiratory symptoms, so your cough, your shortness of breath and your fever uh, was not how our residents were uh, presenting. And even with the second wave, we're seeing more atypical presentations as well, such as uh, just a change in, in, in condition like increased falls and not eating as much, um, diarrhea um, as, and, and just general weakness and fatigue. And so what we've done in long-term care facilities is actually increased our level of surveillance in terms of screening residents. And so we are screening our residents at least once a day. And once there's an outbreak on the site, uh, the, the frequency of screening goes up to uh, twice a day. Uh, Craig pointed to the fact that, you know, it's that sort of a Swiss cheese approach where you have a multimodal uh, interventions in order to keep the virus out. And that's certainly what we are doing in our long-term care as settings. Uh, in terms of uh, screening, uh, we have a screening questionnaires that are administered to visitors, administered to uh, staff as well as physicians. Anybody entering our facility has to go to a screening uh, process. At the beginning of the pandemic, we did implement quite a, a restricted visitation policy, but that has since changed, uh, like Lisa pointed out. Uh, in, on the 23rd of July, uh, the policy was revised to, uh, to adopt more of a, a risk-based uh, approach. And, and certainly um, having different organizations partner or collaborate with their resident family councils in order to come up with a visitation policy that uh, is, is most uh, suitable to uh, the context of that uh, long-term care site. 
uh, we do have the designated uh, um, essential uh, visitor um, who is either a family member or might be a, a caregiver, a formal, informal, hired, but someone who is a key partner, key care partner in terms of contributing to the mental and physical well being of the resident. And so Albertans are allowed uh, to name at least two people that they can designate as those uh, care partners. And then in terms of having other visitors allowed to the site is really uh, up to the site in collaboration with the, uh, the family residents and, and staff at the site. And just like Wayne was describing, there the, are the, the different levels of risk and risk tolerance. And if you look at our sites, there's a lot of variance. There's some sites that uh, uh, older buildings, um, infrastructure is such that, you know, you probably have a single elevator with multiple floors. Uh, the population of residents, if you have a high number of dementia residents who are at risk of wandering. And so in a site like that, the risk tolerance might be very low. And so for that site, they might adopt a more restrictive visitation policy. And usually that is done in concert with family and with residents at the site. And unlike Wayne said, there are some families who really have said, you know, the risk is too high. We don't want to visit. We want, you know, really that sort of more restricted access. And then we have other sites where you have uh, units that are fairly locked off and separated from each other. Uh, you have multiple entrances and exits into uh, the, the unit. And so for those sites, um, and especially if they're located in areas where the community spread is quite low, then the risk tolerance is a lot higher. And so uh, in terms of restriction to visitation, they might have a more open approach to accepting uh, more visitors in addition to the designated um, essential uh, family member or visitor. The other thing that we have implemented in our long-term care site is part of this balance in trying to uh, open up the sites but keep the virus down is widespread testing. And so at the first sign of an outbreak, uh, we will do a point prevalence swab across the uh, affected unit and, and in some cases, across the site, uh, depending on the uh, or sense of how uh, extensive the uh, outbreak uh, is. And um, with the point prevalence swab, we've had to repeat it every uh, five to seven days, uh, depending on the extent of the spread. And so this has enabled us to, uh, once the virus comes in, is to immediately uh, shut it down as much as we can. But as you all know, with the increasing community spread and with the increasing numbers, like Craig has said, I mean, one in 300 people in Calgary have the virus. And so that's a pretty high prevalence. And, uh, and, and so we have seen similar in our long-term care sites where we are seeing more sites go on outbreak. But like I said, once the virus comes in, uh, we do have a number of measures in place uh, to try and contain that spread. Continuous masking, use of appropriate PPE, uh, contact and droplet isolation for residents who are symptomatic, um, mandatory isolation of staff members who uh, are tested positive or who have symptoms that uh, are suggestive of uh, COVID-19. Uh, measures like um, having staff uh, on, go on mandatory isolation has certainly um, helped, has, has certainly contributed to some of the staffing pressures that we have experienced in uh, long-term care. Uh, one of the changes that has happened in the last few days is reducing the mandatory isolation uh, to 10 days uh, as opposed to 14, uh, which actually brings the healthcare worker in line with the rest of the community. And so in terms of how we're trying to mitigate the risk of isolation and social, um, the impact on the quality of life of our residents, uh, there is a lot that we are trying to do, uh, while at the same time being mindful of the fact that once the virus gets in, um, the impact can certainly be very devastating. 
um, like Craig described those numbers, you know, as high as 80% uh, uh, of uh, the mortality cases are definitely uh, attributed to uh, residents in long-term care. And so it's that balance that, you know, is, is sometimes not that easy, um, has led to some very stringent measures. Um, that have been heartbroken, not just for uh, resid our residents and our families, but also for uh, those of us who work in the settings as well. But like I said, it's an ongoing uh, balance. And as we know more about this uh, virus and, and we know more about the incubation period, the, the, the spread, I think we're getting better at implementing measures that uh, minimize as much as possible the impact on social isolation. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over to you, Dr. Silvius. Please go ahead, Jim. Uh, Vivian, I think you have to um, exit. Jim, you're on mute. You might be muted, Jim. Jim, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Excellent. There's two mute buttons on my microphone. Who knew? Okay, there's my disclosure slide. I am going to go past it. I don't really have anything specific to say. Um, I, I want to talk for a few minutes about the context here and some of the evolution of what has happened with COVID-19 in Alberta. Uh, as I, I indicated on the slide, our real experience was with H1N1 back in 2009. And what we had done in terms of preparation was based on what we had learned with H1N1 largely, and we quickly came to discover that this was not H1N1. So we had to look at experience outside of Canada and also at what was happening in Eastern Canada where we were seeing significant infection rates and um, as we all saw, the uh, military were even called in to provide care in some of the care homes. We were dealing with a lot with a lack of good information. And at the end of the day, we were dealing with the unknown. There was a lot of misinformation that was coming out and a lot of contradictory information. And so we needed to do something in order to try to protect uh, the most vulnerable population in our province. And that led to the lockdown that uh, we have been talking about this evening. It's important to recognize that we are governed by a number of different levels here. So there is a federal level, there's an Alberta health, uh, Alberta government level, and there's an AHS level, all of which have uh, something to say about how we are handling what we are doing and what the restrictions are that we may have in place. With Health Canada, it's important to recognize that uh, they have an act called the Federal Quarantine Act. This means that if you are outside the country and you want to come in to visit in one of our facilities, you actually have to go through a process because you are otherwise not allowed to come in. At an Alberta government level, we generally have activities that are directed through the Chief Medical Officer of Health orders. So Order 5, for example, is the order which identifies isolation and quarantine measures that must be taken depending on the circumstances for any Albertan in the province. More specifically, however, for visitation within the continuing care sector, we've had now four orders, the first being on, on March 20th, which was order three replaced on April 7th with a further update on April 28th and finally order 29 on July 23. And others have talked about uh, um, order 29, but just to give you a sense, order three allowed one essential visitor, which was defined as someone who was providing care that otherwise would not be provided and allowed for others as identified by the essential visitor to attend a resident at end of life. So it was fairly restrictive. Order nine added screening requirements, but retained the essence of order three. Order 14 extended to quality of life and care needs, but only one person could visit at a time 
and it added outdoor visits, which at the time were something that was possible in a climate such as Alberta. And Order 29, which is the most current order, um, changed the approach entirely. And then we have um, Alberta Health Services. Alberta Health Services has uh, this, the Chief Medical Officer of Health orders apply to Alberta Health Services settings and sites if they apply to the rest of the population. But the orders that apply to visitation, particularly within the continuing care sector, do not actually apply in AHS settings unless they fall within the definitions um, as per those orders. So we work through guidances which have been established. Uh, we have put in place uh, a family presence and visitation task force. That task force was intended to identify an approach to visitation for AHS sites, including acute care and ambulatory care, but not continuing care, which is covered by the CMOH orders. The initial work was done by a small group prior to the task force being put in place, but since the task force has been put in place, we have worked very hard to uh, address not only the issues in AHS settings, but also to look at how we could uh, map back to and be as consistent as possible with what was happening in continuing care settings so that we didn't have a discordant approach to family presence and visitation uh, across our sectors. The task force was established on May the 22nd of 2020. It is multidisciplinary, it's multi-sectorial, it's consultative, and the intent is to address family presence in a safe but humane way, recognizing the needs not only of individuals, but also their families and their loved ones. Order 29 has been talked about. This became effective on July 23. It attempted to address the competing demands of the mental health of residents and their families with the protection of the vulnerable. And as I've said on the slide, it aimed to try to strike a balance. It needed to address multiple scenarios. It's important to recognize that we're talking about everything from lodge level care where people are more independent and come and go um, more or less as they please to people who are living with fairly significant needs in long-term care and have a limited ability to leave a site. And therefore the order had to try to uh, identify a path that would apply to all of the different types of settings um, that were required. It did incorporate the designated family and support person's language. It's the same language we're using within AHS. And as I think Vivian has talked about, it introduced the concept of risk-based decision-making with risk levels that are established by sites, depending on uh, a variety of factors, including the community prevalence, the age of the site, and some of the uh, constraints of the site, the desires of residents and families, and so on. The big changes between Order 14 and Order 29 are here. Um, and as you can see, the approach, which is really the big difference, moved from being a restricted access approach to a safe access approach, where um, we attempted to figure out how best to allow appropriate support to be provided by, um, by the designated essential support people uh, or persons without um, impeding the uh, the relatively uh, free access that is required when you are trying to support an individual and their quality of life. The other piece that, that was particularly important in Order 29 was it did introduce the safe touch approach, which I think Lisa talked about, um, and that was uh, um, an important step forward. The other thing that it did, which hasn't had as much airtime in my opinion, but which has been critical, is that it also talked about the risk of unknown exposure. And so one of the things that uh, we have seen over time is that people will, in the community, will e express themselves and have behaviors um, and patterns of, of how they are living their lives, which may in fact inadvertently increase their risk of an exposure to COVID-19. And one of the, uh, the nice things that was in Order 29, and as I say, wasn't uh, promoted as much as perhaps it might have been, is that uh, it identified what some low risk and higher risk activities might be that would actually help an individual to decide for themselves what they might wish to modify and what they're doing outside of a, of a setting in order to reduce the risk that they will carry COVID into the setting. 
We've actually taken this uh, further within uh, AHS. Um, we have our guidance, which was most recently updated in, uh, on November 16th. It maps concepts and philosophies back to what is being seen on the continuing care side. It attempts to balance restriction, though, as I say here, while enshrining the role of the designated family support person. It does restrict social visitation, given that we have the number of acute care outbreaks we have now, except for end of life and critical care. And it's supported by some education materials which are relatively new for us. We have two in particular. One is called Know Your Role. It looks like this. The other one is called Know Your Risk. It looks like this. They are intended to be fairly visually appealing. And what it really does is it tries, the Know Your Risk one tries to identify the risks for unknown exposure that might actually put you at higher risk for bringing COVID into a setting. If we can actually persuade people that they need to look at what they're doing outside of our settings and modify their behaviors in a way that reduce their risk of, of inadvertently being exposed to COVID-19, it is one of the pieces that will help us potentially to avoid the situation we were in when we had the lockdowns. And I think that's something that we very much are trying to um, avoid. I also want to comment on something that Lisa said, that visitors are not primarily responsible for bringing COVID-19 into our settings. I entirely agree with that assessment, but that is not necessarily the perception that's out there everywhere. And I think one of the things that it's important for us to recognize is that while it is true that visitors by and large have not been responsible for the outbreaks that we've seen in our continuing care settings, the more people that walk through the door on a daily basis, the, in, the higher the risk is going to be that one of them is going to bring it in. And therefore, as we talk about the role, uh, which was the several slides back of the essential support person, what we're really asking people to do is look critically at the support they're actually providing and try to tailor that support so that they're providing the support that is truly necessary and required uh, without unduly bringing risk into the uh, facility because of the numbers of people coming in. Finally, I wanted to mention that we've also now put in place the compassionate exemption. Uh, this was work that was done between AHS Alberta Health and uh, the federal government. It is a federal and an Alberta process that will allow individuals from outside the country uh, who would be on, under quarantine to visit under certain circumstances, predominantly related to end of life and critical care. We have done the same in Alberta, where we have a process who indiv where in, by individuals who would otherwise be quarantined would still be able to visit into our settings if they follow the exemption process and they have an exemption put in place. These things are all intended to help support families, particularly at difficult times of end of life and where um, an individual has a critical illness. The question that I would end with is where do we go from here? I don't think any of us want to see the lockdowns that we had at the beginning of COVID. It was a necessary evil in, in my opinion. I think Dr. Hinshaw likewise would agree that it was something that was necessary at the time, but in fact, in retrospect, probably was not the right approach to have taken. We need to think about how critically we can support individuals and their families as we go forward. And some of the things that we're trying to put in place on top of what we already have in place are things that I've tried to uh, refer to here. Thank you very much. Um, now we're open for questions and um, I'll read through them. Um, I'll go from the order there were written. Um, first question, is AHS, AHS looking at the staffing patterns and continuing care facilities to move towards a one-site, one-worker, dedicated staff to specific residents? Jim, do you want to res respond to that? Sure. It says somebody would like to answer this question live. That's what stopped me for a minute. Oh, that does, that's just... Um, uh, <laughs> That's just a way for us to keep track of what uh -huh. has been answered. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, I think the short answer to that is yes. Um, we are, um, 
at this point in time, one of the things that we're very much trying to do is to keep up with staffing sites, particularly an outbreak where the numbers of staff who are available have declined precipitously, often at the beginning of a significant outbreak. Underlying all of that, though, is also a broader look at staffing patterns and continuing care facilities. And I think that the, the move to one site, one worker um, has been a positive step at this point in time. I can't speak for whether or not it will in fact end up becoming the standard as we go forward, but I think there are a number of people who believe that it should be the standard going forward and certainly it's under active consideration. Thank you, Jim. The next question I, I think is for Craig. It's, it's really kind of a, a speculative question. In open society, there is much talk of immune system strengthening measures. And I wonder if these things are discussed and implemented in long-term care facilities. And I'm, I'm really uh, asking Craig, if you just talk about immune uh, system strengthening measures that we could consider that might be uh, translated into long-term care, because I, I know you don't work in that setting. Um, and as mentioned here that of course this touches on isolation since depression, anxiety can lower our immune responses. Craig, do you wanna comment on that? It's a great question. We do know that things such as anxiety, uh, especially things like stress, really do suppress the immune response. So mental health is absolutely part of the physical immune health. Likewise, some very basic fundamental nutrition uh, guidelines also greatly help. We've seen in regards directly to COVID that people that, for example, are vitamin D deficient tend to have more severe disease. And by deficient, I don't mean we need to um, overload vitamin D, but, but people who may not be getting enough of the diet, a simple supplement uh, can be quite protective. We also know that dehydration, for example, which is often a problem in long-term care facilities, uh, if airways dry out, viruses have much easier access and, and much uh, uh, more efficient infection. So there are a lot of little things that can be done that are direct immune boosters. Likewise, we have to be careful with things such as prophylactic antibiotic administration and other uh, mechanisms that, for example, hurt our healthy wild bacterial colonies in our airways, but also our GI tract as they're critical to our immune defenses as well. So anytime we have patients in, in any form of uh, an extended care, we have to be careful in balancing those treatments, perhaps for another infection, with the overall immune function of the patient. Thank you, Craig. Uh, next question from Linda McFarland. How many essential support persons or visitors are allowed now? Are all operators following similar guidelines and um, there's been um, some, maybe possibly some confusion out there and inconsistency in, in administration of policy. And I wonder, um, maybe Wayne, could you talk about that? Then I'll ask uh, Jim and Vivian. Sure. I think with respect to the operators, I, I think Jim had spoken earlier about uh, it really depends on a lot of variables about how things are being applied within a, a particular operation from the, you know, once the risk, risk assessment is done, which takes into account the community spread within the area of the site. Um, once the, the visitor goes through any of the, the questionnaire, you know, there'll be an assessment of risk done at that point too. So there is really no one size fits all as we look at all the different uh, different uh, operators and the different sites within the province. Okay. Uh, Jim and Vivian? Yeah, just um, according to the order, it's two, and that is a standard actually, and it can change. So in other words, if you have somebody who is a designated support person and they, for whatever reason, are unable to continue, somebody else can step in. There has been some variable application of that across the province, and I think you know what Wayne's alluding to is the fact that that based on how sites are viewing their risk, um, there may or may not be uh, as much enthusiasm, should I say, for having two designated support persons. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, is this risk-based decision making, uh, which has enabled sites 
in collaboration with the residents and the families and the staff to come to a decision as to um, how visitation should occur. And I think that has really allowed some flexibility based on the infrastructure, based on the community spread, based on the risk tolerance of even the families and the residents themselves. So, that, so yes, there's some variability, but it's variability that was actually requested and, and enables uh, sites and actually families and residents to uh, partake in that decision making. Okay, thank you. Uh, Craig, another question. Um, are you familiar with any modeling that's been done to look at various interventions and their effects of reducing COVID transmission from the greater community to long-term care? For example, rapid testing for workers and staff, reducing number of visitors, physical distancing, et cetera. Uh, do, we, do we have a sense of how effective these measures are or could be? Yeah, I haven't seen direct modeling for long-term care facilities, but modeling for other sort of closed institutions, be it schools or acute care facilities, suggests that each of these can have a positive impact on, on viral entry or viral exposure. The catch is none of them on their own were completely protective. And we have to be careful in balancing uh, some degree of efficacy with a false sense of security. So we have seen situations where we're testing people, you know, for example, uh, south of the border within the White House, um, where they're supposed to be daily testing. And yet, if we believe that, we let down our guard on other mechanisms. So all of these can have an impact, but they need to be considered as a package and as a strategy, as opposed to single mechanisms and hoping to, th that they will solve the problem. Thank you, Craig. Uh, that's wise advice. Also, I, I want to again remind people about the rapid review and the update done by the Health Technology Assessment Unit, which has looked at various interventions and the potential effectiveness. So it doesn't give um, a hard fixed number about how effective they would be, but it would be a great starting point. Um, so this one is directed to, um, to Jim. Is there a user-friendly mechanism where family members can be notified of these very helpful publications that you've shared? Um, and uh, I'll stop there and let you answer that sure. question. The short answer is that these were only released end of last week, so they are fresh off the, the press, if I can put it that way. We did actually send out information via Twitter and uh, other forms of social media, but we do have the intention of having a bit more of a campaign now to try to promote um, the concepts that are in the brochures and so on. We don't actually have a, a sign up, if I can put it that way, however, where individuals can, uh, can be notified. Thank you, Jim. Um, there's a question from Twitter, um, and I'll, I'll read it verbatim. Uh, staff are doing their best, but they can't, they can, but there are not enough of them. And we have known this for a long time. Why have we not taken action? Maybe I'll ask Wayne if you could start uh, commenting on that. Since the start of COVID, and even before the start of COVID, uh, the operators have been uh, in continually in a, in a hiring mode. So it, it's not like uh, they have not been trying to hire. It's, a, it's, it's the ability of, of, of operators to really be able to secure staff. So there, there have been a number of initiatives that have been going on, and, and certainly a number led by uh, Alberta Health and, and AHS in terms of trying to get additional staff involved. But there are competing, uh, certainly at the healthcare aid level, there were competing, uh, competing um, venues for them to go to. And so that were perceived to be less risky than, than uh, you know, working at a long-term care site. So it, it has been a challenge and continues to be a challenge, challenge particularly when a, when a site goes into outbreak. Thank you, Wayne. Um, another question I'll direct us to Vivian. What role does facility size play in the spread of the virus? Oh, and very variable. So if you have a very large site that can actually um, lock off the individual units, 
And so if there's an outbreak on one unit and they're able to sort of just, you know, um, cordon or cohort the residents and the staff, then what we've seen at those sites is very minimal spread. But we do have some other sites that are really huge, um, over 300 residents uh, with units connected to one another, um, single elevators uh, for all residents and staff on the units on the floor to use. And on those sites, we have had a lot of challenges in terms of just um, containing spread. So yes, size does have an impact, but it's really the layout of the building that um, influences the rate of spread. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll just have a, another question or two, but then we'll have to break because we're already over time. And this question I'll direct to Lisa, but then I'll ask Jim and Vivian to comment. The question is, Lisa, uh, would uh, COVID increase to progress or progression of dementia within an individual? Does it worsen uh, the person's symptoms and signs of dementia? And maybe speaking from what you've seen and what you've heard, Lisa. Thank you. This is a, a really great question. So from what I have heard from people who are living with dementia, that a lot of the anxiety associated with the conditions of the pandemic are definitely increasing. They're, they, they are really feeling it, I think, more than um, most people, even though everyone, everyone is feeling a degree of anxiety. Um, and so... I don't, and I don't know if Daniel means if you get sick and you actually um, contract the virus, if that would increase the progression. Um, but just overall, I think that um, just the, the stress of the pandemic has, has had a really devastating effect on people. Yeah I, I, yeah, I think the indirect effects are clearly evident. Clearly, there could be direct effects too. But uh, Vivian and Jim, any comments about that question? No, I entirely agree with you, Lisa. I think the stress has been significant and has worsened some of the expressions um, of dementia in residents, but I don't know that there's actually been a progression in terms of the underlying disease. Yeah, I would agree. I, I wouldn't say progression, but certainly worsening of uh, behavioral symptoms. We've seen that. Um, it's been um, the challenges with ice isolation, we've definitely uh, seen that, um, and suddenly uh, encouraging um, sort of uh, social distancing um, in settings where we have persons with dementia has been very challenging. And also the fact that everybody in the facility is masked, that has been a big challenge too. Um, so suddenly you really can't recognize your caregivers anymore. The staff look different. They can't hear you when you speak. So uh, it's, I think all of that has just contributed to, um, I would say, some degree of cognitive uh, uh, decline um, when people um, have either had the COVID infection themselves or the sites are on, our, on outbreak and all these uh, outbreak measures have been implemented. And I just want to add too, I think that when you consider that the stimulation and the recreation activities and everything that may have been keeping people cognitively stimulated, those have all been removed. And so it just kind of makes sense that there would be a decline in anybody. And this is the last question, unfortunately. Um, so what about new measures and supports which have been implemented for long-term care residents to improve mental health resilience and re resiliency during the pandemic to combat, to combat the impact of isolation? Is there anything people could point to? And maybe I'll ask all three panelists, Wayne, uh, Vivian, and Jim. Yeah, so certainly um, using technology, uh, that is something that we've had recreation therapists uh, be able to assist uh, the residents uh, in terms of uh, FaceTime, video conferencing, one-on-one uh, -on -one activities. We've definitely had some organizations implement one-on-one -on -one therapy, even when residents are quarantined or isolated um, 
in their uh, rooms. And we've actually resumed some social activities while maintaining physical distance. So some sort of social um, um, sit and befit exercises have resumed in long-term care facilities. Yeah, I, the only thing I would add um, to what Vivian said is that I think there's also been a, a significantly increased awareness of the impacts that COVID has had. And I think people have tried to find creative ways to actually support residents given what's, what they've lost. Wayne, any last comment? Yeah, I would just, uh, I would just add that it's, you know, it, one of the challenges, and I think um, certainly Vivian has raised it before, it, it's the, the actual structure of the facility, you know, plays a big part in terms of what actually can be done for residents with, you know, within, a, within a particular site. So it's, um, I think the creativity is, is needed in these sites to see what they can do to try to enhance that for, for the residents. There are so many great questions, but we unfortunately just don't have time. We will try to go through all the questions which have not been answered, and if possible, we'll try to get a response to them and uh, forward them back to uh, the person who raised the question. But I, I'd ask you all to join me in thanking our speakers and panelists tonight for the willingness to weigh in on this challenging and involving topic. And I also would like to thank everyone who has joined us online. We have to get through the current pandemic and the, per the current crisis uh, that we're facing. But I also think it's an opportunity for us to um, think very hard about continuing care, long-term care facilities. And I encourage uh, all of you to uh, read, if you can, the Royal Society of Canada report, Restoring Trust, COVID-19 and the Future of Long-Term Care. Because I, I think uh, it might be a great spur for us to make things better uh, for the current and future generations who will be living in these facilities. Thank you again, everyone. Good night.